All right. Sounds good. Thank Have you. A great, great session. Thank you. Hope you enjoy it. I know we will. Okay, welcome everyone. People are joining by the second. This room is growing. Welcome everyone. We'll get started. Welcome. Welcome to Power Skills 2021 Courage Strikes Back, hosted by the Career Advising and Transition Services at the McGill School of Continuing Studies. Right. Today is already day two of a free three day virtual career summit that has fairly, if you've uh, tuned in, oh, just as everyone is tuning in, just make sure that you're mute. You're supposed to mute yourself just to eliminate any background noise. So um, we are. Oh no, what's I do? Okay, so we're so so pleased that you're here. And oh, am I muted? No, you're not. Can you hear me? Okay, okay, good. Um, and we're sure that this uh, summit is really here to in inspire, to motivate, to create, and to connect you with such a dynamic series of sessions today. My name is Emily Salvi from the Career Advising and Transition Services Office at the McGill School of Continuing Studies. It's my pleasure to introduce you to my colleague, Diana Viola. Hello. Diana Viola, say hello. Hi. So as mentioned, as you're tuning in, you should be muted and feel free to unmute yourself when we ask if there's certain questions, but also you can write in the chat directly and we'll address your questions as much as possible. Uh, the session is being recorded and will be uploaded on YouTube. So when talking about with the team, when talking about who would be the expert to talk about who's the expert on how to treat anxiety, depression, emotional intelligence, as well as how to live your very best life, the first name that came up with was Sandra Reich. Sandra, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Sandra. She is known for getting to the root of a problem and solving it efficiently. Sandra is the founder and clinical director of the Montreal Center for Anxiety and Depression. She's also the co-director of Empowered Women Workshops. She's also the co-director of Anxiety Videos and founder of the Sandra Rich Couple Retreat. She is a best-selling author of a self-help book called Once Upon a Time, How Cinderella Grew Up and Became a Happy Empowered Woman. I just, I can't get over that title. I love it so much. <laughs> Sandra's expertise has been featured on so many radio and television shows, including Discovery Health, Global TV, Breakfast Television, APTN, and recently Celebrity Damage Control, which is airing on the Oprah Network. Her expertise has been uh, you know, featured all over, including she's a regular guest on the Dr. Lori Batito show on the uh, CJAD as an expert on therapist panel. And she speaks across Canada on how to treat anxiety, depression, emotional intelligence, as well as how to live your very best life. I don't know how she manages to do all of that. <laughs> I am so pleased to introduce you to Sandra Reich. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Emily, and thank you so much for inviting me to this wonderful event. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I have a lot of slides and limited time, so we'll try to do the best we can. And um, Emily and I discussed before, if people have questions, I would love and happy to answer any questions. We're covering a lot of material in a little time. Anxiety these days is a huge topic. We're all going through it. This is not an easy time. It's always a big topic. So I'm gonna start right away with good news because I think when we talk about anxiety, we never talk enough about the good news. Um, and I think people think that it's, the, you know, it's their life Life sentence, they're going to be anxious, they're going to be depressed. And I do mention depression too, because a lot of people don't realize that anxiety and depression are two sides of the same coin. Um, as a matter of fact, bring me someone anxious, we reduce their anxiety, we'll find depression. Bring me someone depressed, we'll reduce their depression, we'll find anxiety. So as the slide says right now, I really want to highlight the good news here is anxiety and depression are highly treatable. It's almost embarrassingly simple to treat these things. There are specific things that have to be done and I'm gonna talk about them, but they are very much things that can be managed and your life can be so much better. So I want us all to take a little bit of comfort in knowing that this does not have to be our story. We can definitely get better with our anxiety and depression. 
Briefly, I want to mention how common this is. It's hugely common. Mental illness indirectly affects all Canadians at some time through a family member, friend, or colleague. And 20% of Canadians will personally experience a mental illness in their lifetime. And just for the record, mental illness affects people of all ages, educational and income levels and cultures. So if I was with you guys live, I would ask the room, how many people in the room would put their hand up if, if I asked the question, do, are you yourself or do you know someone in your family or friends suffering with anxiety and depression? And I'm pretty sure I would see there, I see people putting their hands up. I didn't know you could do that on Zoom. Very good. Um, everybody knows someone who is suffering or so, someone in their family or a friend who has anxiety and depression is a very common problem, even without a pandemic. So it's rising. And we want to talk, I want to talk today about why it's rising and why we have such a problem. So what we know about anxiety that people don't always mention is that although researchers don't know exactly why some people experience anxiety disorders, they do know that there's various factors involved. And I want us to really pay attention to this because we all hear talks about anxiety all the time, but I'm not sure we always talk about the different variables. Like many other mental health conditions, anxiety disorders seem to be a result of a combination, and I really highlight this, a combination of biological, psychological, and other individual factors. So we're going to talk about what could those individual factors be. But the first good news here again is a lot of people feel they're biologically predisposed to have anxiety and therefore it's their lot in life. No, that's not true. You may be predisposed biologically to have anxiety, but again, there's a lot you can do and that may not be the only variable. So what are these things meaning? Let's go through them. Biology, again, you might come from a family that has a lot of strong fight or flight adaptations. And I'll explain how that actually is a very good and adaptive quality that your family had, but it could turn into anxiety for you. So if your parents had a strong amount of anxiety, it's a very good chance that that could trickle down to you. And that can go back as far as your forefathers. And that actually might mean that you're the descendant of very adaptive people, I will explain. Before I do that, though, let's talk about the psychological factors. Well, here's a big one that people often don't realize. Emotions, which we all have, when they're repressed in the body, they get stuck. If they get stuck, they will turn into something. If you're lucky, they'll turn into anxiety. If you're not lucky, they can turn into disease. The one I want you to really pay attention to is anger. OK, and for the women in the audience, this is particularly relevant because as women, we're often socialized not to get angry. And what we know is anger and anxiety work on the same system in the body. You actually can't be super angry and anxious at the same time. So that means if you're anxious tomorrow and you just start punching a pillow, which is not a strategy that I necessarily recommend, it would actually work because you can't be angry and anxious at the same time. So here's the interesting part is if, we, if the, they both work on the same system in the body, why is that interesting? Well, what's interesting about it is it means that if you're a person that does not express anger or pushes it down and goes, no, no, I'm fine, it's no problem, nothing stresses me out, I'm easygoing, and that anger gets stuck in your body, you're probably a person who gets a fair amount of anxiety. So often when I meet a client, I'll say, how are you with anger? And they'll say, I don't get angry at all. And as a therapist, I go, uh-oh. Or I'll say to somebody, uh, how are you with anger? And they say, I'm getting angry all the time. I'm flipping out all the time. Anger management patient shows up. Often that's a case of anxiety. So we want to be very curious about anger. Now, this doesn't mean you should go beat people up, but it does mean that we need to be in touch with our anger and be able to express it in an effective way so it doesn't get stuck in our body. What about those individual factors that I mentioned? Well, again, if I was in this room, I would ask how many of you consider yourself type A personalities? And I would put my hand up. Uh, type A personalities have some good qualities. They tend to be movers and shakers. They're, they're busy, they get a lot done. However, they're definitely much more prone to anxiety. They have a very high standard. They tend to be perfectionistic. And this is a predictor of anxiety without a doubt. So I'm not gonna stop being a type A personality, but I gotta make sure I have some strategies in place to make sure it does not get out of control. What about the environments? So I have a picture on this slide, which it's one of my favorite pictures. It's a smoky room. And that's something that's a Sandraism. I say often to my clients, don't go into smoky rooms. You go into a smoky room, you might get cancer. Anxiety, unfortunately, works in a similar way. It is highly, highly contagious. 
Have you ever gone together with somebody who's anxious and at the beginning of the night, you're feeling fine. And by the end of the night, they actually seem to be better, but you seem extremely anxious. Even when I'm with a patient, a therapist, when they're with patients, if they're very anxious, there's a very good chance you're going to start to feel it in your body. And without realizing anxious people, they don't do it on purpose, but they do often try to get rid of their anxiety, perhaps by even pushing it on you. It's done quite unconsciously. So the environment is important. So back to the smoky room is if I'm in a smoky room, if I'm around people who are very anxious, I have to limit exposure. That might be a family member. That might be a friend. We want to be careful about that. This is just a little joke. Apart from the overwhelming anxiety and debilitating panic attacks, I think I'm pretty well adjusted. This is how common the problem is. Let's talk about biology as I promised. The good news on biology, and it is really good news, is genetic predisposition actually might mean that you're the descendant of highly adaptive people. Well, what do I mean by that? Let me explain. Let's imagine that we were sitting around 2 billion years ago and you're an anxious type and I'm very relaxed. We're sitting by a campfire. I'm sitting back in my chair, very chill and you're hypervigilant looking around and a saber tooth tiger comes by. Who survives? Well, I think you guys know the answer. Uh, you survive and I'm dead. So if you have anxiety, the good news is you're probably the descendant of very, very adaptive people who knew what to do in these difficult situations. Those are your forefathers. So where is the problem? The problem is there's no saber tooth tigers now and the adaptation is not caught up. So you're still hypervigilant. You're still looking around all the time. There's no saber tooth tiger. So your brain is going, what's going on? Your body's saying, why am I feeling so, things I feel out of context. And that is often de uh, described as a panic attack. So what's happening is modern day society versus caveman years are quite different. If we get a false alarm, if our body feels like a saber tooth tiger is coming by, the reaction of the body is the same as if there was a saber tooth tiger and it wants you to get out of there. So the, the reaction is gonna seem out of context and it's not gonna feel good. But again, it's an adaptation and an adaptation that came from a, a, good, a good thing. So what I'm saying with that is anxiety is your own body's natural protection system. You need it. I mean, I need to be hypervigilant if I'm in a dangerous situation. If I'm sitting in a room and somebody walks in with a gun, I certainly need my sympathetic, which is my fight or flight nervous system. I need it to kick in so that I can get out of the room and get out of danger. If I don't have that... I'm not going to survive. So again, I want you, if you're sitting in this audience and you have anxiety, I want you to start to become a little friendly with your anxiety instead of being angry at yourself because most anxious patients feel their bodies are laying them down. Your body is not letting you down. It's getting a false alarm, but it's not laying you down. It's actually doing what it should be doing by telling you that there is danger. The problem is perhaps there is no danger. Now, in our nervous system, there are two systems. There is a sympathetic nervous system, which we know more commonly as our fight or flight system. And we have something called our parasympathetic nervous system, which is our rest and relaxation system. And it's really great news here because they can't be on at the same time. So if my fight or flight system is on, then my rest and relaxation system is off. But the good news is if I can turn on my parasympathetic, my rest and relaxation nervous system, by default, I can turn off my fight or flight system. And that's very learnable and fairly easy to do. Now, when your sympathetic nervous system fires, your fight or flight system, it feels like you're in danger, but it's not dangerous, okay? It's uncomfortable. Anxiety is just our body's alarm system. What happens when that sympathetic nervous system fires? So my brain gets a message that I'm in danger and my sympathetic system turns on my fight or flight system. What's happening to my body? Well, a whole bunch of things happen. My heart rate starts to increase. My blood flow starts to change. I start to breathe quicker. There's a whole bunch of things that are gonna happen and I'm gonna to explain to you why they, happen, why they happen and you're gonna see how smart your body is. 
I'm going to start to sweat. My pupils are going to enlarge. There'll be a decrease in salivation. There'll be a decreased activity of digestive system, and there'll be muscle tension. Now, I'll go through all of these, but let me just mention right now, for example, the decreased activity of digestive system. Think about how smart your body is. If a man has a gun to my head, it's probably not a great time to say, excuse me, sir, I have to go to the bathroom. So it's not a great time for my digestive system to be working through stuff. And that's why your body does that. Your body is in high alert and it's trying to get you out of there. And we'll talk about the sweating and the widened pupils as well. It's quite interesting. Well, the pupils dilate so that we can see more clearly. I need to see how to get out of this danger. So my eyes get big, okay? The sweating goes on. This is very interesting. Most people know that the sweating goes on to cool your body. But what a lot of people don't know is the adaptation is the reason we sweat when we're anxious is actually so the predator, when they grab onto us, will slip and not be able to hold on to us. So again, I highlight to you how your body is working for you. It's actually making sure that you don't get killed. Your heart rate increases so that you can get out quickly and the blood moves away from your extremities so that you can punch someone and take care of yourself. We need to have oxygen moving throughout the body so that you can get out of this situation as fast as possible. Another adaptation, which is kind of a funny one, is that the hair is, people talk about their hair standing on end. Um, did you know the adaptation comes from the fact that your hair stand on end so that you'll look larger to intimidate the opponent. So actually everything our body is doing is doing that so that we're going to be out of danger. The problem is in our day-to-day -day life, we're having false alarms and we're not in danger, but our body doesn't know the difference. So to review a little bit what's happening here, the increase in cardiac activity allows the blood to be transported rapidly to our muscles. Why do we need that? to punch, to get out. Breathing is faster for more oxygen to have a better fight. We wanna be able to survive this. Muscles become tense to allow for more strength. I need this to survive. And again, stomach aches due to slowing of digestion for more energy to muscles. So this is a very common thing for anxious patients. Their stomachs hurt a lot. They have digestive problems. This is a result of the anxiety. And I highlight this to parents also because your kids get stomach aches often when they're going to school. And sometimes a stomach ache is just a stomach ache and I'm okay with that. But you have to be curious. Sometimes a stomach ache is a sign of anxiety. And as you're gonna soon learn, avoiding the thing that makes you anxious is the absolute worst thing you can do. So we'll get into that. So as a review, genetic predisposition probably means that the person suffering is the descendant of highly adaptive people. And what we've got is a modern day society versus caveman years, and we've got false alarms. So I have a little video that will just sort of tie this all together before we move on. So I'll just play it for you right now, if I can. Have you run away from a saber toothed tiger recently? Maybe you have, but the stress response you feel when you are late to work or the growl your stomach makes when you haven't had anything but an energy bar and coffee in the morning is the same stress response we had when we were cavemen. That stress response is called fight or flight. Gronk is a real life caveman. He goes to work hunting saber tooths and rabbits for his family. Unfortunately, the saber tooth chases Gronk on occasion and his physical and emotional stress levels go way up. When this happens, Gronk's body's intelligence kicks in to help him escape. His heart rate goes way up, his blood pressure spikes, more adrenaline is produced, and the body moves the blood away from the digestive tract and into the muscles as digesting food isn't a priority at that moment. Gronk eventually does escape and rests at home. And after 15 to 20 minutes, his body resets and begins to operate normally again. Now, your body doesn't know the difference between running from a saber-toothed tiger or rushing your kids to school. Your body's stress response is triggered in both situations. So your blood pressure, heart rate, and food digestion is the same as Gronk's when he's running away from a tiger. These types of situations could happen every day in our culture. The difference between you and the caveman is the caveman was able to relax in his cave soon after he finished stressing out. So for the whole day, the caveman would stress the duration of a hunt, which would last maybe an hour. You, on the other hand, have to deal with the stress of racing your kids to school, traffic, work, relationships, and everything else that life constantly throws at you. Plus, add in the constant chemical stress that comes from the unhealthy foods we eat, and it's like you are running from the saber tooth all day long. The solution is to build your own cave. You have to build your own cave every day, 
And it means finding some peace in the pileup of traffic while driving to work. It means going to bed on time instead of staying up late binging on your favorite TV shows. It means taking some time to go outside and do some relaxing work instead of locking yourself up in your office. Otherwise, this chronic stress will open you up to most diseases because your immune system will tank and a lack of nutrients that your body needs due to not being able to digest your food properly. Add to that the fact that your adrenals, which are the glands that sit atop your kidney and decide where your hormones go, are so active with the abundance of stress you experience and put into your body, you will develop adrenal fatigue. Put all this together and now you know why stress is the start of all disease processes. How can we make our fight or flight more effective? How can we turn it off when we don't need it and bring it up when it's necessary? Ask yourself what you are putting in your body for energy. Your body is probably asking your brain for those artificial stimulants you gave it, like coffee, processed sugars, or genetically modified foods, because it's confused on why the adrenals aren't filling up like they used to. You have sucked your adrenals dry of hormones that didn't need to be active in the first place. That's huge because we are taking a finite source and sucking it dry. What people may not know is that a lot of things trigger the fight or flight response. Emotional stresses, eating unhealthy foods, overreacting to life's daily challenges, going through tough emotional times, all trigger fight or flight. However, that leaves a lot of areas where we can improve it. So if this video has successfully stressed you out with all the info it's loaded you up with, you should take a minute to relax. At least you don't have a tiger running after you. If you always put limit on everything you do, physical or anything else, it will spread into your work and into your life. There are no limits. There are only plateaus. And you must not stay there. You must go beyond them. Bruce Lee. Okay, so I think the video sort of brings us through to where we are at this point and what's going on in our bodies. And now what we want to do is we want to move on. Hold on. Okay, my computer is not doing what it, there we go. We want to move on to understanding better the components and what we do about this and how we, um, what are the things that get us into more trouble? Because I think I have limited time and I think that's going to be most useful for you. So let's review what the components of anxiety are. Physiologically, we've got the muscle tension, the rapid pulse, difficult breathing, nervous stomach, sweating. Sometimes there's a, for a lot of people, there's a depersonalization where you feel outside of your body. This again is very normal when you're having an anxiety response. Again, not dangerous, uncomfortable. And then there's the cognitive cognitive factors as well. There's the anticipation of the worst, the sense of danger, feeling helpless. And of course, there's behaviors that come along with this, which are difficulty concentrating, um, pacing, fidgeting, and the big one that we're about to talk about, avoidance. The biggest, biggest friend of anxiety and the biggest enemy for you. So we'll talk more about that. So here we're going to go through a little bit of um, uh, what happens when somebody has a panic attack. But let's even look at that even as an anxiety attack is maybe you don't have panic attacks. So the first thing that happens is we go to number one, long-term stress, worries, and fears accumulate in your anxious mind. I mean, these days, who doesn't have that? I mean, we are very concerned about what's going on. Your subconscious mind eventually will misinterpret those fears as real danger. So that's number two. Number three, the sympathetic nervous system kicks on. The fight or flight hormones like adrenaline are released by the subconscious to help you handle the danger. Your subconscious mind is doing what it's supposed to do. It thinks you're in danger, so it, go, it releases the hormones. Since you don't, conscious, you don't consciously see danger, you don't recognize the out-of-context hormone sensations, and therefore you fear that. So I'm sitting here minding my business, and all of a sudden I'm feeling depersonalized, my heart is racing, I'm sweating. Oh my God, I must be dying. And as a result of me now feeling uncomfortable and going, I must be dying, we go to number five. In response to this increased fear, even more fight or flight hormones are released, but there's nothing to fight and nowhere to flee. So now I'm stuck with all these emotions. I don't have a saber tooth tiger to take on. There's no man with a gun. So it's just overwhelming me. Number six, my fear increases and that increases the sensations. More hormones are released. And then we get to number eight, which I call rinse and repeat. It just keeps going and going and we're in a panic attack. So you can see how it just spirals because the more it feels out of context, the more we get worried, which is why many people show up in the emergency room thinking they're having a heart attack because it's just not making sense. Here we go. What gets us into major trouble?
This is the most important slide I will present to you today. When you avoid something, the fear gets reinforced. So let's look at the picture first. I'm giving a workshop right now to you guys. Let's say I start to feel anxious as I'm giving this workshop. Well, I'm then gonna start scanning for danger. Well, I'm gonna see, are the people looking at me okay? Is this going okay? And my heart is racing, I don't like that. Physical symptoms are intensify. My attention narrows and I start, stop looking at my PowerPoint and I start going, oh, my heart is going like at a weird beat. And then the natural tendency is going to be that I want to escape or avoid this. So maybe I'm going to say, I'm sorry, guys, I'm not feeling well, I'm out of here. Okay, because that will get rid of the anxiety. But here's the most important part. The short term relief is the danger. By me leaving a situation that makes me anxious, I have just increased the anxiety. I've taken, if you think of anxiety like a little beast, I just fed him a gourmet meal. He just got double in size. The long-term effect of me leaving something that makes me anxious is an increase in physical symptoms of anxiety, more worry, loss of confidence about coping. Next talk, I'm going to be like, oh my God, what if that happens again? An increased use of safety behaviors, which I'll talk about in a minute. So I'm going to be repeating this quite a bit. Avoidance will make your anxiety worse. So avoiding something, and it will feel better. Of course, if you're nervous, you want to get away from something that makes you nervous, but unfortunately that's going to make things a lot worse. So what about rituals? Well, what if I start counting the tiles on the floor because it calms me down? Is that beneficial? Unfortunately not, because then my brain learns that if there's no tiles on the floor, I can't calm down. Avoidance equals anxiety. Again, there are many ways of avoiding. So again, anxious feeling, I want to avoid it. There'll be an increased sensitivity. Medication, not all medications, but some medications will in fact allow you to avoid coping with the feeling. So then we're still avoiding the confidence that gets developed from facing our fears. And it's normal to have fears. Flipping out on people is a good way of not dealing with your anxiety too. Let's have a fight with someone. If we have a fight with someone, we'll feel less anxious. They'll catch the anxiety, we'll feel better. But actually in the long run, you're gonna feel worse. And the distraction, this is a big one for people in my field, is how about instead of coping with my anxiety, I start taking care of other people. A lot of us do that particularly women, by the way, and I will be talking about that today. When we're taking care of other people, we're actually avoiding dealing with our issues. Now, I'm a paid caretaker, so if I'm paid to do it, it's no problem. But the moment I'm doing it off work, you're going to see there's a bit of a problem, or more than a bit. People do these common ways of coping. They do rituals, they carry objects in their purse, um, you know, a rabbit's foot. And if you're doing that, it's working for you, listen, okay. But the problem is we really want to convince your body that the answer lies within you. Another thing people do is they do drugs and alcohol, okay? Smoking weed and drinking alcohol. And you're gonna go, oh my God, maybe she's a prude. I'm no prude. Um, I'm an ex-bartender actually. Um, that's not the issue. The issue is that smoking weed and alcohol are both depressants. Depressants will further your problems. And second of all, even if you feel better after a lot of clients tell me that they use alcohol and smoking weed to calm down, again, your anxiety is not getting better because it's learning that their external substance is the answer to your problems. So there's no increase in your confidence behaviors and no decrease in your anxiety, not a good long-term solution. Now be careful that I, I, I have to be careful to make sure it's clear. I am not talking about very good um, prescribed drugs uh, depending on your situation. I'm really talking now about taking a glass of scotch or you know uh, smoking a joint, which uh, if I wasn't talking about anxiety, I really have no comment on. Um, you do whatever you want to do. But when we're talking about anxiety, not a great solution. Nervous, tapping your feet, checking your watch, avoiding eye contact. These are also signs that will get you into trouble. I definitely wanted to talk about the role of repressed anger. I mentioned it earlier. Repressed emotions are a general concept in psychotherapy research surrounding anxiety. Specifically, when you're not expressing those feelings, they get trapped in your body. They build up in yourself and they will come out as anxiety. Anxiety. or the hot potato effect. I've alluded to this a few times already. 
if you're anxious, your tendency is going to want to be, and it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's quite unconscious. Your tendency is going to want to be to throw it at someone else. Do you ever get together with someone and they seem to want to start a fight with you? And you're like, why are they standing a fight with me? They might unconsciously be trying to get rid of their anxiety. And if you fight with them, you just caught the hot potato. So you have to be careful about that and not get into that because anxiety is very contagious. So what do we do with all this? We know that we have to be careful about avoiding, but we also know that anxiety is highly uncomfortable and we don't like it. Now, here's another interesting piece that I want to mention to you. And it, it's, it's kind of like um, something that, that personally bothers me. When I train therapists, we run an anxiety clinic and we have lots of fancy strategies for uh, clients. When I train therapists, I tell them, if you don't teach your clients or get your clients on paying attention to food, sleep, exercise, and you go to your fancy strategies, you're ripping off your clients, not cool. If your food, sleep, or exercise situation is not under control, you will be uh, have a propensity towards anxiety. They have to be first. Years ago, somebody called me asking me to treat them for their depression. And they said they had heard of me and that I was good at it and they wanted to be seen by me. And I was like, great. And they started talking on the phone. We were about to set up the appointment. And she says, I just want to tell you something. I don't eat. What? <laughs> Pardon me? Uh, she says, well, I don't eat and I don't want to talk about it in therapy. Did I see her? I did not. I cannot, I am not a miracle worker and neither, neither of any of us. If we're not eating on a regular basis, it's actually every three hours our food, our body needs food and we're not eating nutritious food. And that starts right in the morning with break, breakfast, which is broken down as break the fast. Our brains get very irritable. And our, if our brains are irritable, we are much more prone to anxiety. So we need to be having a protein, a carbohydrate, and a fat. That's at our meals. And we need to be eating snacks. Now, my clients like to say things like they're too busy for this. And I usually grab a bag and show them. You can grab some nuts. You can bring you know, a yogurt with you. There's lots of things you can be doing. But you need to be eating throughout the day. Sleep is another one. We need sleep. It's really, really our friend and it really helps our brain to work through a lot of things. So the more we're getting those seven to nine hours of sleep a night, the less chance we're gonna have an anxiety symptom. Certainly during the pandemic, I've noticed when I don't sleep, I feel a lot worse, more down, more prone to feeling stressed. Exercise, a non-negotiable. Um, as a matter of fact, there's plenty of research that shows exercise has the same effect as SSRI medication, which is the medication known as an antidepressant medication, which is the medication that's usually used for anxiety. So some people take medication and some people don't want to take medication. That's a whole other discussion, but you want to get cardiovascular exercise in your life. So cardiovascular exercise, the next resistance comes up. Well, I don't have money to go to a gym. There's a pandemic. You don't need a gym. You need to be able to walk you need to be able to dance. You need to get some sweat going. I give you a money back guarantee. You put in 20 minutes a day or at least three times a week, you will see an enormous reduction in your anxiety. Now, here's an important question for you guys, for people that you love who have anxiety and keep telling you they're suffering. If they're not doing food, sleep, exercise, the question is, do you want to get better? And Everybody would think, of course, people want to get better, but that's not always true because if you want to get better and there's strategies that will help you to get better and you're not doing it, in psychology, we believe there's a secondary gain to not getting better. So we have to look at it. And that's really where the second part of my lecture is going to go. So these are what they are, secondary gains. I'm just going to check the time. So um, I'll mention the secondary gains and then I'll just, if anyone has any questions at this point, I'll take a short pause and then I'll continue on with these secondary gains because they're important. So um, I'll just finish the slide and we'll see if there's anything pending. And if not, we can do some questions at the end. So what could be the gains from staying not well? Could there be gains? Well, actually there are a lot of gains to not staying well is, you know, the role of the victim, martyr and caretaker come up here. And I'm gonna go in detail about this, but let's just talk about the victim, for example. I mean, if, if you're suffering, people pay a lot of attention to you. People are concerned about you. Attention, unfortunately, is a primary reinforcer. So there can be secondary gains. So if I'm working with a patient and I'm giving them strategies and they're not doing the strategies, I've gotta be curious what's in it for them to stay unwell.
So this is where the psychoeducational part comes up. Emily, do we have any questions or should I move on? We have questions, I can tell you. Uh, and then you can see if you wanna answer now or there's also the Q&A at three o'clock. Yeah. So the first one was, uh, so we have lots of comments and questions. People are resonating with everything that you're mentioning about anxiety uh, and anger. And so one of the questions was, can you explain, so I'll tell you all of them. I'll ex can you explain depersonalization? The next one is, um, Kevin, what about intermittent fasting? Is that not a good thing during therapy? And the last one that I see, and we may be having others scrolling in as I'm reading this, some people suffer from Paul, some people suffer in silence and are not aware in silent and are not aware of it. How can parents detect if their children are suffering from anxiety or how can someone detect if their loved one is suffering in silence? What are some signs uh, to look for and how can we get professional, how can we get them to get professional help? These are really great questions and um, I want to answer every one of them. I will not be able to answer them all now because I won't be able to finish. So Emily did bring up a very good point that at three o'clock today, I am being interviewed and, and doing a Q and A. So um, the big ones, the depersonalization, the how can we get our kids, recognizing our kids and uh, how do we get someone to get help? I would ask those people to come to the three o'clock because uh, those are bigger questions. Um, the quick answer on the uh, intermittent, I forgot to mention that because I always get that question. So I am a believer in intermittent fasting and I think that they, you got to make that work for you. And I think that there is definitely a lot of research on that that shows in a good that it does good things. We just have to be careful if you have a propensity towards anxiety not eating food for a long time, the brain becomes irritable. So we got to find a way to do this, that your anxiety is not increasing and only you will know that. Uh, the rest of the questions, Emily, if it's okay with you, I will uh, put them to the end or for three o'clock. What do you think of that? Yeah, that's great. I have uh, about uh, 20 minutes left and I want to talk about the victim, martyr and caretakers. I think that will be helpful, but I'll try to go through them quickly so we can talk about how pe we can get people help because I think that's an important one as well. And depersonalization, all what I can say briefly about that is again, that's an adaptation because the body feels, everything feels surreal because the body is going, what, the reason you're depersonalized is that there is no saber tooth tiger. And so your body thinks there's a saber tooth tiger. So every everything starts to be blurry. It doesn't make sense. When things don't make sense, our bodies seem to feel depersonalized, derealized. It does not make sense. Things are out of context, but we can talk a bit more about that later as well. And thank you all for the feedback as well. Let's talk about caretakers. Caretakers are very prone to anxiety. They're also prone to relationship, relationship problems, which I, I did say I would mention in this talk. I'm a professional caretaker. Okay, and I often give this talk to nurses and teachers and professional caretakers get themselves into a lot of trouble because we get paid to take care of other people. But the problem is that when you take care of people out of a professional situation, it's dysfunctional. So Emily mentioned, I wrote a little book on this a few years ago, Once Upon a Time, How Cinderella Grew Up and Became a Happy Empowered Woman. Um, and I'm not mentioning it now so much as a plug, but to say that it was sort of interesting because it's a tiny little book, but I just talked about caretakers, victims and martyrs. It became a bestseller because it resonated that caretakers, there's so many people, so many of us, and I'm really a recovering caretaker. Let me go on record on saying that. There's so many of us that spend our lives taking care of others. And again, I'm not even talking about professionally. I'm talking, it's a personality trait. People come to you with their problems and you're really good at solving their problems. The problem is that that will get you into trouble every single time. Why do I say that? Well, here's my question to you guys. What do you think is the secret wish of a caretaker? If you were in front of me, I would wait for an answer, but I won't do that today. The secret wish of a caretaker is to be taken care of. Now let's think about this. We take care of others and our secret wish is to be taken care of. And again, if you were in front of me, I would say, how's that working for you? And there'd be a nervous laughter in the audience because it doesn't work. The more we take care of others, the less they take care of us. So it's a, it's a problematic system. I'm gonna go take care of other people and I'm gonna hope that they're gonna take care of me. But in fact, they're gonna go, this is great. Sandra's taking care of me, I like this. They're not gonna take care of me. And I'm gonna get more and more hurt, more and more depressed, possibly more anxious. And my relationships are gonna get out of balance. As I take care of other people, 
I can't have boundaries because you can't caretake someone and have a boundary at the same time. What happens when you protect someone from a natural consequence? They don't learn. The problem is our society reinforces caretaking. People say, oh, you're so nice, Sandra. That's so nice that you're taking care of people. That's such a nice thing. I'm not talking about my job now, okay? Or there, you're so nice, Emily, or whoever we're talking about. It's so nice that you take care of everybody. So you get reinforced to do it more and more. But the problem is it benefits everyone around us, but not ourselves. Now, people get nervous at this part of the talk that I'm going to say that you can't be kind. I'm all about kindness. It's coming up. Caretaking is where we get into trouble with codependency and there's a caretaking is a synonym for control. Because like the little cartoon says come in and I'll protect you but you'll have to do what I tell you or I'll eat you myself. And the other slide says one of the happiest moments ever is when you find the courage to let go of what you can't change. And the truth is we can't change things outside of ourselves at all, unfortunately. Here we're going to talk a little bit about uh, this concept that boundaries and caretaking are mutually exclusive. So we have to have limits of what we can do for other people. So how do we know what's appropriate and what's not? Well, this is a very good uh, illustration. Doing things for other people. If you're helping them, no problem. Doing things that people really cannot do for themselves, no problem at all. You wanna teach them how to make a CV, great you're doing a very good thing. Enabling is things that people, and this is for our kids too, things that people or our kids can and should do for themselves. That's a problem. So if somebody says, I can't find a job, helping would be teaching them to make a, a proper CV. Enabling would be financing them. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you can see the difference on that. Now, the problem is when we enable people, people do not rise up. They don't get better. They just keep pulling you and you start to get unwell. Like this little poem says, and I won't read it out loud here, but setting boundaries does not make you mean. Okay. You can be extremely kind to people and still have limits on what you're willing to do for people. So, one of the biggest ways of knowing if you have this problem is to check if your cup is full, so to speak. Have you attended to your own needs and desires before helping someone else? If you're taking your care of yourself first and then you want to help people, that is great. I'm all for that. I think it's wonderful. Keep going. If you've taken care of yourself first and then you take care of others, you're going to feel great. If you've not attended to your basic needs and start helping someone else, you will undoubtedly start to display symptoms of exhaustion anxiety, depression, or physical symptoms, then we're in caretaking. Caretaking becomes dysfunctional when you consider taking care of your needs selfish. Actually taking care of your needs allows you to be of greater service to the world and the people you love around you. You're happy and healthy and can really be of help, not only in direct ways, but also by role modeling what happy and healthy look like. So it's a little bit like the airplane. You put the oxygen mask on you first and then you can help others. Um, so you can actually change the world and be very kind to people if you take care of yourself first. We have to be careful about the over-functioning and under-functioning dynamic. So if I start to take care of you so much and you're sitting back and not taking care of yourself, we're going to have me working hard and you getting lazy. Like this little uh, cartoon shows, sure glad the hole isn't at our end. The two men at the top are relaxing while the two men at the front are doing all the work. This happens with teenagers. This happens even in therapy. If I'm sitting forward in my therapy session, coming up with ideas for my client to get them to feel better, and they're sitting back and looking board, I have to go, wow, I'm working harder than my clients. That's a problem. So we don't want to do that. Overfunctioning gets us into trouble. Our job is to guide, but we don't work harder than others that we seek to help or we foster dependency and people actually don't get better. Now, the danger is that people needing us is a huge hit to our ego. So that's why we do it. It's short lived and it's similar to any other drug, meaning you'll need more and more of it and you will be prone to anxiety. When we're busy giving our energy to someone else, we start to leak energy. And if we think about leaking energy, what is a depression after all? And who suffers depression the most? Well, depression is leaking energy. And just for the record, women are very, very um, prone to depression. And isn't it interesting? Women are very socialized to be caretakers. This is something we can learn from men. They're, they're quite good at boundaries, usually, not in all cases, but often. Women suffer depression two times as much as men do, and it might be in fact related to a naturally slippery slope of caretaking. If your pockets are empty, you can't give anything to somebody, 
Okay, so you got to fill your pockets first. You're leaking when you do that, and leaking energy is a surefire recipe for depression. Here's a quote from Dr. Christine Northrup. She's a very famous doctor, and she says, we don't have to wait to develop cancer or other diseases in order to get the message that we need to change our vibrational point of attraction and begin creating health. None of us is completely free from the fear, anger, and stress that come and go as a part of normal life. When these emotions become intense enough to affect our psychological and emotional well-being on a regular basis, we're heading for physical illness unless we resolve them in a healthy way. When our daily unresolved pain, anger, and frustration rob our bodies of vital health producing energy. It is essential to bring healing and understanding into our daily thoughts, emotions, and actions. She's saying what we've been talking about is that really anxiety is a symptom and you're lucky if you get anxiety. It's your body talking to you. It's saying that you're not taking care of yourself. It's saying you're not dealing with your emotions and it's much better to get an anxiety symptom than to get a physical illness. But it's the first sign that there could be danger. So how do you still stay kind, but not be a caretaker? Well, um, again, I'm all about kindness. So just ask yourself these questions. To be a kind person and not a caretaker, you're fine if you're doing this. Whatever you're giving out to others, if you're giving it to yourself, that's kindness, all good. If you wanna do something nice for your neighbor and you do that same thing for yourself, no problem. If you're giving to others with not taking care of yourself, you're in empty pockets. And empty pockets is a recipe for trouble. Is it kindness or is it caretaking? The true test of this question is very simple. Is you do something, if you feel energized by it, that's kindness. If you feel depleted, that's caretaking. Do you have the idea that you know what's best for other people? For sure, if you're operating from a position of knowing what's best for others, even our family members, you're off in the wrong place and that's not kindness. We only know what's best for ourselves and only trained professionals can give advice. And even us trained professionals only give advice when solicited on what might be best for someone. I don't go up to people on the street and I don't think they'd appreciate it. If I went up to them and said, you know what you're doing wrong with your life? I mean, they'd slap me and, and they should. It's not appropriate. So if someone comes in for a professional session saying, my life is a mess, where am I going wrong? Then yes, a professional can give advice. Otherwise, we, we do not know what's best for others. And we let people arrive at those conclusions on their own until and if they wanna seek for professional help. One of the most empowering things you can do for anyone is trust their ability to solve their own problems. So check with yourself. Do you believe the person in question that you're trying to save can deal with their own life or have you fallen into savior complex where only you can save them? Even as professional caretakers, we must remember that people ultimately save themselves. So it's a good idea to get into the habit of sometimes when people are saying to you, I don't know what to do. How do you like, help me, help me, help me. Sometimes to say, you know what? I trust that you will be able to figure it out. Helps them and it helps you. Here's another clue that you're in, could be in trouble with caretaking. Are you feeling anxious or depressed lately? That's a big cue that you've fallen into caretaking. Healthy behavior does not bring on symptoms, but giving with empty pockets or with over responsibility lends itself to anxiety or depression symptoms. So you're extending yourself, you're doing too many things for other people, you start to get anxiety, no problem. It's just a reminder, oh, I need to take some time for myself before I keep on giving and giving and giving. Last, I think this is one of the last ones and an important one. Do you have a preponderance of needy people around you? Do you find people are always coming to you with their problems? Dysfunctional caretaking attracts people with problems. So if you find yourself wondering, why does everyone come to me with their problems? You've probably fallen into caretaking. It's not happening, happening randomly. It's happening because you've fallen into this habit. Do you know the difference between empathizing with someone and fixing someone? Fixing someone is getting into a dance with them, and that is definitely caretaking. Empathizing is not an energy zapper. It's saying, I feel for you. Like, that sounds really rough. And once again, it allows the person to find their own solutions. And that's healthy and good and won't get you into anxiety. More clues that you're in caretaking. Caretaking is controlling. You're getting into other people's business and telling them how they should live their life. Very tempting to do. You can imagine for me, I get paid to do this. And sometimes I see people I love in trouble. Of course, I want to tell them where they're going wrong. And I have to, and I don't always get it right. But I, I told you I'm a recovering caretaker. I have to remind myself, is this my business? And it's not. 
If it's not my business, it's not for me to get involved in it. Another sign is that you will feel resentful. You just keep taking care of other people and you just keep feeling there's nothing for you. No one takes care of you and you start to feel bitter and angry. So what's the antidote? Very simply, you need to take care of yourself. Self-care is paramount. Again, if you're not taking care of yourself, what could be going on? Could it be the payoffs that we talked about? Could it be victimization? Could it be martyrdom? We only have a few minutes left, so I'm just going to talk very briefly about victimization. I probably won't be able to get to martyrdom. Um, when we fall into the role of a victim, we must always remember as adults that there is an antidote to victimization. The antidote to victimization is choice. And there is always choice. The choices are not always good choices, but there are choices. Giving your child up for adoption or going on welfare are not good choices. But the fact that there are choices takes you out of victimization. And we have to always remember that because if we fall into victim, most likely we're not gonna feel better and we're not gonna get better. How do we know we've fallen into victim? Well, there are some, some things that show us that we've fallen into victim. For example, the language of a victim, a victim tends to say things like, I have no choice. They argue about the choice. They say, yes, but, yes, but with every solution, they have a but. They say, why me? And they say things like, it's not fair. And don't feel bad if you've said these things because I've said them, we all say them, but it's, we're falling into victim. These, this little cartoon shows a little bit, even where someone was asking about how do you get someone to get help? Often people will say, well, I'd go get help, but it's too expensive. It's too long. It's too simple. It's because sometimes it is very simple. It's too childish. It's too random. It's too dark. These are reasons to stay stuck in victimization. So what would be the payoffs of being a victim? So I'll just go back to that for one second and then I'll move ahead. We talked about it. If we get stuck in victimization, number one, there's a tension that comes our way. And number two, we don't have to take responsibility for our lives. We don't have to change anything. So we have to be very cautious, both with other people and with ourselves, that if we're hitting a wall and there's trouble in our life and we keep saying yes, but to every solution, then we might be getting a little bit of a payoff for not getting well. And we got it. The way out of that is to go, Sandra, there are choices here. Yeah, but I don't like the choices. Well, but the fact that there are choices is better than not having choices. Okay, so these are things we got to consider is that yes, but is 100% keeping you in the role of the victim. So I won't be able to talk about martyrdom, unfortunately, but basically martyrs, again, self-sacrifice. And the self-sacrificing is, again, everybody else's needs is more important. And the reason they do that is they end up feeling really like they're, you know, I'm really a good person because I don't exist. And that also is a recipe for anxiety and a recipe for trouble. Now, what happens relationally if you fall into these roles? romantic relationships. Well, victims fall in love with persecutors. They have to because victims are victims. And where there's a victim, there's a perpetrator. So they're going to end up in a dance. It could be romantically. It could be with a friend. It could be with a family member. They're going to dance with someone who ex like takes advantage of them. The caretaker ends up dancing with an exploiter. We've got the over-functioner and under-functioner situation again. The more I take care of you, this is again, not in a professional, professional situation, the more tendency the other person is gonna take advantage of that. That's human nature, unfortunately. And the martyr who self-sacrifices and feels guilty for ever taking time for themselves ends up dancing with the narcissist. The narcissist is self-absorbed, selfish manipulator, learns very quickly, I just make you feel guilty and you'll do what I want you to do. Um, the language that you use will tell you if you're falling into these traps. The victim says it's your fault, it's not my fault. In every story they say, there's someone else's fault, not their own. Their caretaker says, I'll take care of it, I'll take care of it, which really means I wanna control what's happening. And the martyr says, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care where you wanna go eat, what do you want? Where do you wanna go eat? Which really means I don't wanna be responsible. The conclusion of all of these is these are all ways of becoming extremely unwell and very susceptible to anxiety and depression and getting into some relationship problems. So how do we get out of this and how do we light the way and how do I wrap this up for you guys? Well, there are these thoughts that we generate in our head, these stories we tell ourselves, and if we can challenge them and remind ourselves we have choices and remind ourselves of options, and remind ourselves of the strategies, remind ourselves not to avoid things, then we can change our thoughts. And if we change our thoughts, we can change our lives. And we do have choice always. And isn't that wonderful news to have choice always? And as adults, we do have choice, not always easy choices. 
changing your thoughts and those around you, which you can do by role modeling and strategies, by the way, changes the world. And I thank you very much. Andra, um, you are, obviously, you know this, you're an incredibly captivating speaker. You're such a powerful storyteller. I feel speechless. Even the comments in the chat were just, everybody was relating to the session because I think you spoke to so many people's lives or everyone here. You impact my relationship with others and those I observe, around, the relationships I observe around me. You've left us with so many amazing takeaways. I don't even know where to begin. I wanna thank you so, so much for the session. We're really lucky to have had you um, give such a captivating presentation this morning. And, uh, and we have questions, but I know that we have two minutes left. Uh, and so I'm going, I just want everyone to know that you can ask Sandra some of those questions at three o'clock uh, during her Q&A. It's going to be a session moderated by uh, the manager of the Career Advising and Transition Services team, Rosalia Felice, who recommended this uh, incredible speaker, Sandra Rich. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Um, I do want to know, I know we have, I, I don't, I know that every question is going to take some time, so, so I think I'll leave it as, as that, yeah. Do you want me to take one or two before we wrap? We have plenty of questions. Um, people are really appreciative of your honesty and the way that you've gone about uh, just tackling every area of, of anxiety and, and you know, taking care of yourself. Um, do you want to answer the question about suffering, kind of suffering in silence and not being aware of how to detect that in others, like for example, in, in children? Okay, well, the suffering in silence, again, we got to wonder just what we talked about. Um, somebody just asked a, another question came up on my screen, but we got to always remember is why would we suffer in silence? Is there a payoff? for doing that and that I presented a little bit on that is that is there a, a secondary gain because suffering and silence is not a good plan so we need to be active in our healing um so I think that that the first part of that question is maybe not suffering in silence and maybe being proactive about what we can do the second part of the question is about how do we get children to therapy and, and by the way someone was asking how to reach me i'll just quickly say um the website is helpforanxietydepression.com helpforanxietydepression.com and the clinic's number if you need to reach me is 514-777-4530 um emily what was the question about the children um or about somebody getting can parents detect if their children are suffering from anxiety or how can someone detect if their loved one is suffering in silence what are some signs to look out for and you have mentioned that as well yeah and yeah we, yeah the one that's tricky with children is the uh, stomach aches that I mentioned. And again, avoidance. Avoidance is always a sign of anxiety. So that's the key one you're watching out for. You're avoiding driving. You're avoiding, um, not kids, obviously, but what you're avoiding going places. Your children don't want to go to school. Your children don't want to do a presentation in class. Now, the thing is that the more, as parents, we want to protect them, right? But the thing is, the more we protect them, the more lightly uh, the anxiety, not even lightly, the anxiety will definitely increase because the brain learns when when we avoid something, the brain learns it's dangerous. So if I was giving this talk and I didn't feel well and I then left the talk, my brain learns that giving talks is dangerous. And if I, if I have that message to my brain, it's gonna get worse and worse. So your children, you wanna be watching, are they avoiding things? You wanna be watching, as I said, the uh, avoiding eye contact, tapping behavior, um, you know, um, not being good at expressing emotions. We wanna encourage our kids to express emotions. Emotions is a big, big factor in psychology these days is express we used to think emotions were problematic we now know emotions are your guidance system if we're not in touch with our emotions and expressing them, we want to teach our kids to say i'm sad i'm angry doesn't mean i'm going to give them the lollipop but it's still okay to say i'm angry that i'm not getting the lollipop we want to teach them that and the more they learn that the less they're going to have anxiety if they are avoiding and they're starting to not do things now here's another last little piece on this at that point, they probably are suffering from anxiety. Now, here's the golden nugget of it all. 
When we get a call at the clinic for a child needing help, we almost never see the child at first, if we see the child at all. We see the parents. And the reason for that is the real solution for a child with anxiety is clear boundaries and consequences in the household. The more we caretake and the more we try to facilitate anxiety, the worse it's going to get. So if you bring me an anxious child, I'm likely to see very well-meaning parents who are letting too many things go. Kids, like all of us, need um, structure, just like we need the police on the street. If the police weren't on the street, the world would feel chaotic to us. It gives us a sense of safety. Kids need boundaries and consequences, the first thing you can do with a child that's anxious. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining. Sandra, we'll see you at 3 o'clock. And uh, once again, thank you for such an incredible session. It was a really a pleasure. And thank you all for your great questions. Please come at 3 o'clock. I'd be very happy to answer them.